Can so, someone help me figure out how I can, how I can't hear anybody. So we're going to get started. Um, welcome everybody to this information session on the literacy grant um, that the Maine Department of Education is about to release. Um, we're excited to have you here. I'm going to start. Uh, my name is Beth Lambert. I am the Chief Teaching and Learning Officer here at the Maine Department of Education, um, and I'm joined by an amazing team today. So I will turn it over to Leanne Larson, who will introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to see all of you. I'm Leanne Larson. I'm the Director of Early Learning in the Department of Education. Some of you I recognize from other projects that we intersect with, so it's wonderful to be um, collaborating once again. And I will pass the ball over to Renee. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to see so many faces uh, joining on the screen today. Um, my name is Renee Riley, and I'm the Literacy Grant manager for this project, uh, but many of you may know me from my previous role in the department as the continuous school improvement coordinator. Uh, so again, I'm really excited about this project and that you're joining in today to learn all about it. And I'll pass it off to Tracy. Good afternoon. I'm Tracy Whitlock. I coordinate special projects for inclusion out of the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education. And I'm really glad that all of you are here to learn more about this literacy grant. Absolutely. So this is our this is our our main team. There's lots of other folks at the department who um, work in this area and cross over, but uh, we will be the four that you'll be talking with today. Um, if you are are bringing questions with you, which I'm sure many of you are, um, we have a brief presentation that will walk through um, and might answer some of those questions right away. Um, but if you can hold on to those um, or put them in the chat, if you if you want to make sure you get them out, that's fine. Put them in the chat, and um, we're going to work to answer them at the end of the presentation. If and we'll be also creating a frequently asked question document with that. Um, if there are questions that we, we can't answer today or are specific to your SAU or your situation, uh, we'll be following up uh, in the next day or early in the beginning of next week um, with you to, to answer those. Um, as I said earlier, this is being recorded and the recording as well as the FAQ will be sent out um, following this meeting um, in the next, as I say, we're at the end of the week. So hopefully before the end of this week, but if not at the beginning of next week, as things go. So uh, without anything further, I'm gonna pass it over to our grant manager, Renee, who is gonna walk us through our agenda for today. Thank you, Beth. So uh, today's agenda, as, we, as Beth said, we're gonna have just a, a short presentation and maybe answer some of the questions that you did bring to uh, this meeting. Uh, so we're going to go over the setting of the context of the literacy grant and kind of the background behind it, uh, going over the core instructional practices that uh, this grant is focusing on. Uh, we'll also talk about the allowable expenses, uh, highlighting uh, some key components of the application and where that will be residing, uh, going over the grant timeline, We'll be explaining uh, the SAU survey that was mentioned in the uh, Grants for Me eBlast and the priority notice. We'll also be highlighting some next steps that you can take as the, uh, the, the SAU level. And then, as we said, we'll open up the floor uh, to you guys uh, for any questions that you still may have um, after the presentation. All and right. Hand it off to Leanne. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. So we wanted to start this afternoon just by setting a little bit of context that will, uh, we hope, um, explain why the department's offering this opportunity to our school systems across the state. Um, I'm sure that all of you who are with us this afternoon recognize just how foundational literacy is to the learning that our students do every single day. Um, and really being highly literate in today's world is um, a civil right and an issue of equity. We want to ensure that every one of our learners is building strong literate ability 
um, right from the time that they're born all the way through a lifetime. Literacy learning is something that happens throughout the course of our lives. The Department of Education um, has worked in many different arenas to help support literacy learning. Um, and in recent years, we were actually asked by our state legislature to engage in a study of beginning reading instruction in the state and to gather some information about what's been working well and where there are some pockets of need that exist. I noticed just scrolling through today that some of you who are on the call were actually part of um, some of our outreach efforts, whether you um, submitted information through the survey that we offered or participated in focus groups to give us input um, about how things had been going in your school systems. Out of that two-year study came a series of recommendations, um, and one of the recommendations was around providing more financial support to school systems to be able to address some of the literacy needs that exist. At the same time that we were conducting this particular study, we've also been receiving a lot of requests from school systems across the state for support with um, implementing stronger evidence-based literacy practices. And so the intention in this grant is to be able to help you target those particular literacy needs and really make sure that the approaches that you're using are evidence-based. We know that first and foremost, children need strong core literacy instruction. That general, sometimes referred to as tier one of instruction is something every student needs to have access to. And for the purposes of this particular grant, that's where we're asking you to focus your attention. Renee, if you want, you can move to the next slide. So as we start to explain the grant this afternoon, what we'd like you to keep in mind is that these particular grant funds should really help to support strong core instructional practices in classrooms. The grant will span classrooms from pre-K to 12. But as you're thinking about those core instructional literacy practices, what you see on this slide are all components that make up strong core instructional practices. Everything from systematic and explicit instruct, excuse me, foundational skills that students need in order to build their literate abilities, oral language development and knowledge building that helps children, students be able to make connections between their experiences, various cultures, the ideas that they're learning, concepts that they're learning, making sure that students have access to culturally responsive and grade appropriate literacy materials, and that they're able to engage in with those materials in authentic ways so that they are learning how to transfer their literate skills into the kinds of uses that they will need for a lifetime. Core instruction requires attention to very strategically planned whole group instruction, small group instruction, as well as individualized instruction. It also requires plenty of opportunities for teachers to teach and reteach concepts and skills and for children to have opportunity for practice with those skills. Literacy instruction benefits from attention, not just to essential components like the phonemic awareness, the phonics, vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension that you'll hear about shortly, but also from building children's executive functioning skills, making sure that you're paying attention to instruction being motivating and engaging for children, thinking about how we um, design experiences that engage children in purposeful play and self-directed inquiry in their learning. And finally, 
Core instruction benefits greatly when we're partnering with families so that we are all working together to support children's literacy learning. So please keep these um, core instructional practices in mind as you're make, being thoughtful about how you want to spend the resources that um, you're going to have an opportunity to tap into. And I think I'm passing it back, Renee, to you. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. So um, I know a lot of you probably have a lot of questions about allowable expenses. So the next couple slides, we're going to dive into a little bit uh, more details about what would be allowable uh, for expenses to this literacy grant. Uh, the literacy grant funds can be used to support uh, pre-K through 12 with um, evidence-based literacy uh, professional learning and uh, materials. Um, and it's to meet an identified need within the SAU that will build the capacity of year-long core literacy instruction for students within the SAU. Uh, the SAU can focus on a specific grade span or grade spans, as long as it's inclusive of all students within the grade span and support students to equitably engage in core instruction. And again, I know Leanne talked about it, that it, it's important that these funds are supporting students within that core classroom in, instruction. The uh, awarded literacy funds for your SEU can be obligated and spent as of the day that the, or date that the SEU submits an approvable grant application. And um, so the expenses have to be spent um, after that date. Nothing prior to that date would be uh, reimbursable. We've had some of those questions come in. Um, these literacy funds can be used to reimburse some of the following expenses. And this is, you know, just a snapshot, just some examples. It can compensate educators for participating in evidence-based literacy professional learning opportunities, um, internal instruction and program review, as long as it's outside of their contractual obligations. So that would be an example of some salaries and, and benefits that could be uh, reimbursed. Uh, it also could be fees associated with professional learning opportunities that are on evidence-based literacy practices, such as registration fees, uh, the travel associated to um, get to the professional learning, as well as the salaries and benefits for the staff members attending the professional learning opportunities, again, along as, it's, as long as it's outside of their contractual obligations. And then uh, an, another example would be to purchase evidence-based literacy materials. Uh, to go further, uh, all professional learning and literacy materials must, again, build the capacity of the year-long core literacy instruction, or it can be, it can be for classroom-based interventions. But again, it is that uh, expectation that it's the classroom level instruction and interventions. It also can uh, support evidence-based literacy instruction and assessment materials, uh, target any combination of the following components that Leanne touched upon. Uh, so it doesn't have to be all of these components, uh, but the materials would have to be um, on one or more of either phonics, phonemic awareness, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Uh, some other questions that we know you probably have is about the application itself. Uh, the application and invoicing will be in grants for me. Uh, we'll talk about the timeline in a little bit, but uh, the application is not live yet, but it will be soon. Um, applications, um, the requirements for the SAU will be to um, identify a literacy need or needs within your SAU and a root cause of that need and explain how, uh, how addressing this literacy need uh, mitigates the impact caused by the COVID pandemic. So there is that piece of it. As we said in a previous slide, the literacy project within the application can focus on a specific grade span, as long as it is inclusive of all students, and the project supports the students uh, to equitably engage in that core instruction. And so when you're building that project, you would just be able to explain in details how uh, your project would meet those requirements. The literacy project action steps 
that you will be uh, explaining in your application must incorporate evidence-based literacy activities, teaching practices, materials, and professional learning. Uh, the uh, application must include at least one SMART goal in that SEU um, that they hope to achieve based on those action steps. The goals must be, again, a SMART goal, so specific, measurable, attainable, results-oriented, and time-bound. The measurable piece of it uh, must aim to increase reading proficiency and or teacher knowledge of evidence-based literacy teaching pedagogy. Uh, the time aspect of it should be the end of the grant period, which is 930 of uh, 2024. The progress on the SMART goal will, re will be reported in the performance report, which will be due uh, October 30th of 2024. And we understand that the literacy grant has a short period of performance. It's a, it's a, um, a shorter grant period. So the goals and progress monitoring can be based on um, things that aren't maybe typically thought of. It could be based on teacher observations, uh, training and course completion, local student assessment data. It could be pre and post teacher surveys covering topics such as teaching practices and teacher readiness as far as uh, teaching that core literacy instruction using evidence-based teaching practices. Uh, the SAU will state the intended impact of this literacy grant by specific uh, by specifying which grade spans that they're going to be focusing on and the number of students it's impacting with the use of these literacy funds. So we'll be able to capture that data. And then SAUs will also explain how they plan to sustain the literacy activities, strategies, programming, and instructional practices beyond this literacy grant, because we're really looking to, to help SEUs strengthen their, their long-term instructional practices beyond this grant. So the grant timeline that some of you may be wondering about, um, we do have a very short, brief SAU confirmation survey that I'm gonna to touch upon uh, in a few minutes here. And that is due by end of business day of January 12th. And that survey, uh, as I said, I'll, I'll be talking about here in a moment. The application is still being finalized. And so that we hope will be open to SAUs to start completing as of January 26th of 2024. If by chance we have it open early, I will send an e-blast out to all SAUs letting you know if it opens early, um, because that, that could be a possibility, we never know, but we do hope to have it open by at least the 26th. The application due date is February 16th, and we do understand that that's, that is a short turnaround, um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment as well. Uh, just to let you know, because I know you guys are anxious to spend these funds, which I love and I'm excited about, so even though the applications are due by February 16th, I will be reviewing them as soon as they get submitted. Um, I'm very used to reviewing grant applications in my previous role of continuous school improvement coordinator. And I really strive to do a quick turnaround when, you know, as, as soon as possible to make sure that you have that application reviewed. And if there are any questions, I'm able to touch base with you and resolve those in the quickest way possible. Uh, the SAUs do need to obligate and spend these funds by September 30th of 2024. Um, and the literacy grant performance report, uh, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about later once the grant actually gets opened and, and, and uh, the funds are expended, uh, but that will be due at the end of October, October 31st. And then SAUs need to invoice for the reimbursement of these funds by December 30th of 2024. Uh, and that invoicing does take a few weeks and you only can do one at a time. So make sure if you have the ability to, if you have some of these invoices in, uh, get them in sooner rather than later so that you can get those reimbursed in time. So as I said, uh, there is going to be a very short uh, in, intent to obligate survey that uh, SAUs will be filling out. Um, the main DOE hopes to expend the entire $10 million that we have 
uh, for this literacy grant. So in order to do so, we're asking that all superintendents complete this intent to obligate survey by Friday, January 12th of 2024. So uh, just a short time away. And that's for all superintendents to fill out, whether it's a yes, we plan to um, expend these funds or no, we, we're gonna pass on those funds. The reason why this is really important for all uh, superintendents to do this is that all leftover funds will be redistributed uh, because as I said, we truly want to use all $10 million of these uh, literacy grant funds uh, for SAUs. And we are asking for it to be by the superintendent. That gives us uh, confirmation that the, the superintendent is on board with uh, this grant and has given either the yes or the no uh, directly to us. So we will get this survey out not only in this presentation, and I'm going to be sending it out through grants for me to superintendents to complete uh, through grants for me as well. So next steps, um, as we said, we're very understanding that this window for completing the literacy grant application is fairly short. So uh, we're hoping that the information that we shared during this meeting will kind of help you start planning uh, what evidence-based literacy project you would like to focus on in your SAU. Uh, so that when the application opens, you'll be able to enter the information and details in that you've been gathering over the next couple of weeks uh, fairly quickly. Uh, so while you have these couple of weeks to be thinking about it, we're hoping that you'll start thinking about and determining your SAU's literacy needs that needs to be addressed. So you start looking at your data, uh, start looking at the information that you have in your, your SAU uh, so you can determine your need, start researching what evidence-based action steps that you uh, hope to use. And again, those action steps might be professional learning, might be literacy materials. Um, and again, having it be evidence-based. Uh, start thinking about your SMART goal that, or SMART goals that you uh, hope to uh, work towards during this literacy grant. And then start thinking about how your SMART goal might be monitored so that you can have those steps put into place and be thinking about that. And like I said, if you start gathering that information now, uh, once the grant application is, is live and ready to go, you can quickly put that information in and get it submitted uh, for my review. So we're hoping that that will help lessen the burden of getting that application turned around so quickly. Uh, so finally, we know we've thrown a lot of information out to you and uh, you may have some more questions that uh, you may either not think about during uh, this Q&A that's coming up next or just some follow-up questions. So please feel free to reach out to Beth or me uh, via, via email or phone and we'd be happy to help you further. Um, and at this time, we are gonna open it up. Uh, we try to save a big chunk of time so that we can answer any and all questions that you have uh, for us. And maybe we can answer all those questions ahead of time for you. Okay, so I've stopped sharing and I'm going, let's open it up to questions. So there are quite a few people on this call. I can't see everyone on the screen. So if you wanna use um, the hand raise um, function, that'd be great. And if we don't have folks live wanna ask questions, we'll go to the chat. So yes, we've got one superintendent's office oh. hand raised. <laughs> Hey, Can't Beth, see you, sorry sorry. About oh, that. oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, my name's Monty. I was trying to Monty. get my, uh, get that to change the name so you'd have a name there. But yeah, so I, I am in superintendent and most of the time, anything with grants for Maine that ends up being my job. And so I'm, I'm used to functioning in there and about the, um, you know, like root cause and the things that we see like in the tier three grant. And uh, because this year's has been quite a bit more comprehensive than in the past. And so um, so I know from the email we got the other day, there's there's not very much money there for us. And I'm, I guess, like just trying to make a practical decision on us jumping in or not. If, if this is the equivalent of something like 
ESEA or the school improvement through you know the tier three funding or something if it's at that level um i don't know if you guys have any sense of that yet but just like for me to undertake that and know the follow-up that we'd have to do um you know to buy some materials out of there it would be great but it's it's not a lot so i do you have any sense of like time commitment with because we got to do a fast turnaround so i have to make a major commitment to pull this off yeah so thoughts on that what do you what do you got i can jump in just because i've lived in both worlds monty um, i was the, the school improvement coordinator previously you probably recognize me a lot yes <laughs> you and i worked really well together um and i i I had a lot of say in how that application was structured, even for this coming year. Um, that was something that I helped build before uh, switching roles. And I can say that this application is definitely a lighter lift. I don't think it will take districts. I, I know it won't take districts as long to uh, create the application. Um, as I said, with my experience in the school improvement, that is a heavy lift. You're doing a lot of uh, data analysis and um, you're doing root cause and five whys, and there, there's a lot uh, up to that application. Um, and this, we've been creating this application over the last couple of weeks, and it's it's definitely a very doable thing. And I think if you start pulling together the pieces that I just spoke about, um, that you'll be able to fill up the application pretty quickly. Okay, thanks, Renee. I appreciate it. And that. I'm just a phone call away. All right, next, Heidi. Yes, hi. Um, I have um, a few questions. I don't know if I should ask them all, but my first one is, is this for the whole district or is it, can it be, because we have like five elementary schools, can it be for one elementary school or does it have to be for the whole, all the schools in our district? I don't know if you want me to answer that. Um, I, I, it is open to a specific grade span. I think if you're hitting a specific school, as long as you can identify the literacy need and why these funds would help mitigate um, and help you achieve uh, reaching uh, the need of those students within that span, as long as it's again for the core instruction uh, for the for the school or for those grade levels. Okay. And is there, um, does it have to be, so if we picked a grade span of grades three through five for our district, is there something that all the teachers have to sign on for in those grade levels or for the school or it's, we run the grant and whoever participates participates or is there a sign on? I think it, it, it depends on, I guess what you're, using the funds for if it's materials then it would be the, the the teachers within that grade span would be using the materials that you're purchasing to implement in, into their core instruction if it's pd then they would be um, taking part in the professional development that you're using the funds for i guess what i'm i'm, I'm saying is so say we have a hundred teachers that teach grades three to five and only five of them show up to the professional development. I mean, we. I mean, is there an expectation that all the teachers will show up to that professional development? Uh, I don't know if someone else wants, wants to weigh in, but I guess it would also depend on how you wrote your SMART goal. If you said 100% of your teachers three through five are going to do this PD, then that probably would be hard to meet that goal. Okay, but so we can if say you're targeting, if you're targeting teachers okay. that need this professional development in a particular so, teaching practice, I think then that okay. would be fine. All right, so we could say that 50% of the teachers will participate. We don't have to have 100% say, yes, we'll do this. What are your thoughts, Beth or Leanne? Yeah, I mean, I think you should have a realistic goal, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, okay. like, it, no point in putting something out there that you know, it's not that you can't achieve. Right. And I always should be 
somewhat aspirational. And of course you want, <laughs> you will want all of them to, <laughs> to right. attend, I would imagine. So, you know, okay. that's good. That's a good answer. I like it. Right. <laughs> um, my other question is you talked about um, getting the um, superintendents to complete the intent. And you said if there are schools that are not going to participate, you said there'd be a redistribution of funds. So does that mean that eventually the amount that we were allocated could increase? Yes. And would we have to um, show how we would spend that increase? Like through another um, writing of SMART goals and whatnot? We should have that, that the reason why we're asking for that intent to obligate so soon is we will have all this information and recalculate the allocations. And so you will be notified through your GAN, your grant award notification. You will know the exact amount at that point if there is a change. Okay. All right. I will take a pause and let someone else ask questions. Thank you. <laughs> Great questions. Uh, Mitchell? Yeah. Hi, ladies. Um, hi. Just Is this going to be similar to the ESEA grant process where if it's submitted um, and there's something that we haven't done correct, uh, that we'll have the opportunity to edit it and send it back? Absolutely. As long as this is done by February 16th. So we would be better off uh, submitting it earlier so you have a chance to read it, something we need to fix, then you'll let us know. Okay. Absolutely. Would that, would that be through email or do we have to go on uh, Grants for Me website to see that we have to do that? So with Grants for Me, just like the ESCA consolidated application, you should get a email generated saying that the application is sent back uh, not approved and that you need further edits. Um, because this application is time sensitive, um, I I plan to also reach out to SAUs directly um, for any time sensitive, you know, if there's things that need to be fixed on it so that we can get that quick turnaround. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Christine? Um, first of all, thank you for hearing us in the field for the need for these funds. Um, I I, I don't really have a question. I appreciate having this this morning and I want to give a huge shout out to Joanne Dowd at Kittery. Um, through MCLA, she kind of pulled a bunch of members and got us all thinking about this. And I just wanted to say with 125 people on this call, um, I hope that people get together with their regional reps, whether mm -hmm. they're curriculum groups or whatever they are to bounce ideas off and um, be able to turn these around. Um, I'm seeing lots of familiar faces on here, all thinking the same thing. And the power in numbers, especially when you're trying to give us funds and we're trying to get it in the correct wording um, so we can push this through. So um, I just wanted to say thank you and uh, you know appreciate and hope we all reach out and work together to get these done to meet the needs in our each in our, our own districts. Absolutely. Thanks. Jesse? Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks, first of all, thanks for making this available to us and sounds like you're muted. It may. Oh, um, there we are. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Somehow you keep muting. I think you started I'm coming across Gail's. As yeah. Gail, so <laughs> somebody keeps muting Gail. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah. There we go. Sorry about that, everybody. Once again, I want to say thank you for making this available to us. Um, I had a question similar to John, La, um, John, on the on the chat, just about how do you define um, uh, research based, and is there like a list of um, materials that you that are uh, sort of pre-approved, or is it up to the SAU to determine resources? How do you define that? I'm curious. So it is evidence-based um, and we are oh, we are compiling a resource for SAUs that we'll be putting out. Um, it will be attached to the application. I'm also planning on sending it out with the recording 
and the FAQ document will be embedded in the FAQ document. It's a resource for uh, SAUs to use that will help them determine and find the evidence-based um, literacy uh, materials and programs and things like that. So we do have some resources we've compiled together as a team. Uh, so that PDF will be available for uh, SAUs to look at to kind of help uh, weed through those those pieces and hopefully answer some of those questions. And if there are any questions after you review that document and as you're researching and, and looking for those resources, uh, you can reach out to any of us and we can help guide you as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Heidi? Um, the grants for me application, I know that generally they're sent or shared with um, Title I directors or assistant superintendents. Is there a way that they can be shared? Because um, I know I won't have direct access. I probably don't have direct access to it unless I reach out to them. Is that how all information is being shared directly with superintendents? So when I'm sending out eBlast who grants for me, uh, the, the first one that I sent out, well, the only one regarding the literacy grant, I should say, um, I selected the roles of LEA authorized rep, which is typically the superintendent. And then I also linked, tagged the uh, ESCA consolidated application director role. So those are the two roles that I sent it to. Um, what role do you have in grants for me? Because the roles are kind of unique compared to what job titles are. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a literacy coach, but I also have worked with the tier three grant and um, have had access that way. But I believe um, I got my access through my assistant superintendent. So I was just kind of curious if, um, I know some people on here are not in the two roles that you mentioned, if there's a way to get access or we will need to reach out to those people. So uh, this application is similar to, um, just for reference sake, it's similar to the Title I summer reallocation application that was also doubly yes. used at, as the ARP summer learning. And I was part of that application process as well. Um, so when, if you're going to be responsible for uh, the application for that particular grant or this particular grant, um, your superintendent would need to add you as, as that role, okay. uh, but we can work on that as well. Not a problem. I just wanted to make sure that I was contacting the right people so that we Absolutely. can move forward. Thank you. Absolutely. You're welcome. Renee. Yes. I'm, I'm wondering if once the application goes live, if there is a way to um, be able to create like a PDF of the questions that could be made available. I'm wondering if that's Heidi, what you're kind of asking is there, will there be a place that can easily be shared with others what the questions are? Cause I anticipate schools will probably work in teams to put their applications together. Like a PDF of the, the mock-up of the application you mean, or? Right. Yeah. Right. We could send that out. Um, seeing no more hands, I'm going to move to, we have one in the Q&A, which asks, um, how does writing fit in? It doesn't directly fit in any of the reading pillars, but does it apply here? And Leanne, I'm going to let you mm -hmm. take that one, um, if you would. Oh, is she frozen? She looks frozen. She'll be She's back in a minute. She's definitely frozen. She'll be back in a minute. <laughs> so I'm going to move to the chat. Let's see. Will a, yes, a copy of the presentation. We can send out the slides um, for sure. Um, can you repeat what the measurable part of the SMART goal must be? You know, you want to take that one? Yeah. So, and the question was, you know, student performance and or teacher knowledge, and it's actually one or the other. You can have your SMART goal um, based on uh, student performance achievement towards uh, growing their literacy proficiency, or it can be based on a SMART goal based on building teacher knowledge and that literacy pedagogy. So it can be either one, and you can have more than one SMART goal. Be, there will be an option to add a row to 
make a second goal, but you only need to be required to have one goal. Hope Megan? Question. So I have a follow-up question um, for that one. So if we're choosing to do our SMART goal based on reading proficiency, uh, are the SMART goals going to need to be met before the performance report is due? So it would have to be met by October. Yes, the the the, the performance report is due in October. So the end goal, um, and that will be part of the application. It actually specifies that the end time for that SMART goal should be 930 of 2024. And that gives you a month to pull the data for that. Good question. Okay, next question. Will assistant superintendents be allowed to complete um, or just superintendents? Um, and so I think that might be about the survey. No, that's okay. So the survey is for the superintendents just because we're trying to capture this um, quick survey from the superintendents specifically, so they're on board. They ultimately are the ones that sign off on the grant. As you know, through Grants for Me, they're the last sign off before it comes to me to review. So we want to make sure that they're on board before we set those allocations, before we get those definitely defined. So we, it would be the superintendents to do that. Um, and then I want to, I'm not sure if we answered this, Danette, Do, can we expand upon the evidence-based allowable expense? Maybe you might need to come off mute and just make sure we, we know it. Yeah, <laughs> I think when we were talking about those resources, that, that document that you're compiling, that's exactly what I was saying. So thank you very much. Excellent. Um, and I think we answered the timeline on the SMART goal. Um, can funds only be used for PD and or instructional materials, or can it be used for something like salary benefits for tutors or something to support family involvement or student attendance as they impact literacy acquisition? Renee? Um, I can try to answer that to the best I can, and then maybe someone else can um, add to it, uh, but it is for um, core instruction. So that core classroom instruction, um, it, like we've said, it can uh, be based on a grade span. It doesn't necessarily have to be the entire SAU as a whole, um, but it is for that core instruction, either materials for core instruction, professional development for teaching practices, um, for evidence-based literacy instruction. Um, for It wouldn't be for things like tutors. It can be salaries and benefits for the uh, teaching, uh, for teaching staff to attend professional development. Uh, but tutors, that's more of an inc uh, a pull out type of a model. And this is for all inclusive uh, for the classroom instruction. Um, and then uh, again, for, for attendance. And yes, attendance is a huge impact, but again, it's to support core instruction. Hopefully I answered all of that. Um, John, the question about research-based materials and a list, did we answer that or is there more to that question? I'm seeing here, maybe. I'm gonna... I might be able to speak to that. John's oh. my administrator. Um, yeah, that was one of our big questions here was just, um, I think you answered it earlier, Renee, but just, um, we are in the process of, of choosing a new um, program for tier one instruction. And so we were wondering if some of the programs that we're looking at would um, fit with this grant. Yeah, when I send out the resources, if you still have questions, definitely feel free to reach out and we can I can help you support you with that. Thank you. Yeah. Is there a sustainability approval form um, or approvable form step similar to ESEA after which funds can be spent? Similarly, is there a supplement, not supplant clause similar to some federal funds? So I can answer for sure the substantially approvable form. We're not going to have a, a two-step, I can't talk this afternoon, apparently. We are not going to have a two-step approval process like we do at the the ESCA or even um, the most recent up-to-date uh, school improvement 
um, application just because this is a quick turnaround and as I said, there there are only a few questions within the application. It's it's a one pager, so um, it's it's just a matter of if it's approvable. Uh, but it is based on the date that it was submitted. So let's say you submit the application on February twelfth, but I don't review it until the fourteenth. When I review it on the fourteenth, and it is perfect, it's ready to go, it's approvable. You can start. You can kind of back date, and you can spend those funds as of the tenth. Um, but I just would be leery of doing anything uh, for big spending prior to that. because You do want to make sure it's, it's approvable, uh, but it is a one-step approval process. Um, a supplement, not supplant. Um, I'm, I am not exactly sure about the, the ARP funds, how, how that plays in, but where you're meeting the need of a, a literacy need within your SAU, I would assume that if your SAU has a need and has and it, it needs to be addressed, then you wouldn't be um, supplanting anything that the district is already doing. Like if you need decodables, let's say, if that's a need, then you probably don't already have access to that in your SAU or you wouldn't have a need for us to support you with getting those decodables. All right. Can the funds be used for writing materials or only reading? And then looks like there's a follow up. Um, you want me to take that one, Beth? Yes, please, okay. Leanna. She's back. Yay. <laughs> yeah. You froze right when I had a question. I, I know. I told you that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the funds could be used to support writing materials, but you need to be able to demonstrate how that's going to be connected to the components that are required. So you'd have to show a connection, for instance, to how that might build writing or excuse me, reading comprehension, how that might impact um, children's ability to encode language a lot, you know, as part of their ability to learn to decode. So you could make a connection to the phonics. Um, or phonemic awareness piece, um, you've you've got to be able to show that alignment to at least one of those components. All right. Listening to this webinar, it seems that the application will be closer in length to the Tier One A summer reallocation as opposed to the ESA annual grant. Is this true, Renee? You are exactly right, Marilyn. Uh, we, to the point where we're. We're kind of using that that template and grants for me. That's how we were able to get uh, this grant turned around quickly. Um, and if you're familiar with that application, uh, that first page will be uh, fairly similar to what you uh, saw in that Title I summer reallocation. The page two where it talks about the number of days of your program and the number of hours, the number of staff, that page isn't even in there because obviously that's not pertinent to this grant application. So yes you're 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 spot on that's it's going to be very similar in length that application is it possible to use the funds for a startup pre-k program as those students would not have been affected by the pandemic i can take that if you want great, great. Uh, so so the funds have to be spent by by september 30th so that means nothing can be pre uh pre-reimbursed, prepaid. So this, the funding for this has to be spent prior to that. So I'm not sure um, how a, a pre-K program could be started um, for next year because it would only be a month worth of salaries and things like that anyway. So, um, so that would probably not work in this case. Uh, it would be for the materials uh, and learning for supporting the students in their core instruction that are existing in the classroom right now. Lynn, did you have additional thoughts on that? Uh, it, it may be pushing it back to Joanne a little bit um, to see what she was thinking, but I, I'm wondering, Joanne, if what you're wondering about is, is it possible to use these funds to invest in materials program that supports a pre-K program that you're starting that would impact those 
those students in that classroom or potentially professional learning for those educators related to literacy who are that are going to be serving those students. Yes, exactly, Leanne. That's exactly what I was asking. Thank awesome. you. Yeah. It, Perfect. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Renee and Beth, but to me, that seems like a legitimate use of the those funds. It it you would probably have a, a difficult time showing impact on student learning because you're not going to have that group of students to work with. So you might think more along the lines of the professional learning for the teachers um, that they would need in the use of those materials. And I think you could certainly make a case that there has been some impact to children before they're coming into school. <laughs> we have certainly seen that well documented. Um, uh, Don, did you have a question? I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, I was unmuted. Um, so I want just wanted to dovetail on to Joanne um, in the in the thought that. In the past, we have had like a jumpstart pre-K program um, in the summertime. And so in similar to the kids come for a couple hours and do some prep because they missed whatever they missed um, to prepare for pre-K or kindergarten. Um, so I was wondering if either one of, if that sort of thing would be covered. I think that might fall outside the bounds of the core classroom instructional component because you wouldn't be serving all of the students that, right? It's more that I think lands more in an intervention that's specific to a certain group of students. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You guys are asking really great questions. <laughs> I love it. You're thinking, this is what it's really great. Uh, the next question is, can a qualified educator fill out this application? Um, which is yes, if, but the superintendent will need to sign, yeah. like, sign off, so. Yeah, it's, it would, I would typically think it would be like a curriculum coordinator, literacy um, interventionist, specialist, some, you know, something like that, but it's all up to the SAU and who the superintendent um, assigns to fill out the application, but ultimately, as Beth said, it is a superintendent that has to sign off on it. Okay, can I clarify that question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're we're doing a, a tier a tier three grant, and the principal has to be there to fill in all the information in all the boxes, and uh, because he's involved with that. He's thinking, I just can't take on another grant responsibility. Uh, and we do have uh, qualified people to fill out the application. And that's why I was asking the question. Our, our literacy team wants to be a part of this grant and we want to make sure that we are allowed to fill out the application. He can approve it and our superintendent can approve it, but can are we allowed to do the legwork? This is an SAU level grant, so it is the funds are being allocated to the SAU. It's not being allocated to a specific school or principal. So um, I don't know what your administrative structure looks like, but it 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 can be done by a superintendent, assistant superintendent, a curriculum coordinator, gotcha. you know, like I said, literacy coach. Great, thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. And if you have again like a specific question, you can reach out to me, and we can work out. Um, how to have that application filled out. Because I agree, that's a lot if a principal already has the school improvement on top of it. So once we are approved, if our plans change, can we modify for reapproval? I'll be reviewing my cues um, in grants for me. So if you do make an, a, a revision, then I will definitely be looking for those and review it if you need to, you know, change, if you change your mind and need to shuffle money from, from one area to the other, that's completely okay. And I'll look for those. 
Um, lots of love for the questions beforehand. We'll get those to you. Uh, can some of these funds be used for the salary of a literacy coach? So that's a complex question, kind of like the pre-K question, because the funds, the period of performance does end so soon, you know, soon in the school year. Um, you can um, hire a consultant for uh, the rest of the school year for PD throughout the summer and then into September. Uh, you can uh, send just for examples, again, just kind of throwing ideas out there. You can send a, 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 a teacher to get some training to be a, a literacy coach and, you know, to get that um, kind of the uh, training to be able to do that internally. Um, so there are some things that you can do with that. Um, it just, again, it has to be within that period of performance, which ends uh, on September 30th of 2024. And because of how grants work, you can't pre uh, prepay for anything ahead of time. So would have to end on September 30th. Can the grant cover one piece of a core literacy program? For example, evidence-based phonics. Yes, so we talked about, um, there are those five key components and you can do any combination of, you can do one, three, five, um, and as long as it's evidence-based and meets the other criteria of the literacy grant. Great questions. How about core instruction to support summer programming? That that is a little bit tricky because it is uh, for sustaining and building the capacity for students engaging in core instruction for year long, you know, the year long instruction. So I would need a little bit more information on how you would build that project out and what it would look like if you want to come off mute and ask more details. And if anyone else wants to speak to that, they can. Yeah, I was really just considering um, what, how we could enhance the summer programming. Um, so I kind of use that core instruction um, term. Um, not exactly sure what that would look like yet, but just considering if that's a consideration. So like one of the things I'm thinking of, and again, this is, it's hard because we're trying to use these funds in the short amount of time and, and uh, support as many students and SAUs as possible. So we are trying to think outside of the box, uh, but let's say you want to order literacy materials that are evidence-based to support a specific grade span, and you can get those materials in prior to summer. Um, maybe those students have access to engaging and using those materials throughout the summer, but you know, the students would also use them during their core year long instruction as well. I don't know how Beth and the team feels about that. Yeah, I would just say it needs to be part, I mean, simply put, mm -hmm. and again, mm -hmm. it would be specific, but it needs to be part of something larger than just something that's happening in the summer to be your summer programming, but rather part of something that's starting this spring, supported throughout the summer and launching into the fall um, in order to, to really meet those requirements, I think. Can we purchase subscriptions like iReady for the school year of 24, 25? Okay. Um, again, the period of performance ends September 30th. <clears throat> so that it wouldn't be able to do next year's subscriptions, unfortunately. A good question. I love, love how you guys are thinking. Same thing. Can we purchase tech intervention subscriptions such as IXL? So one high school and two elementary schools in the district, just one application is necessary, correct? Yes. Yep. You just build out your project. If you want to hit two, two grade spans, just um, build out your project and, and give the details of that project within the application. This is a long, long one. I'm trying I to, read it. to get to the Me question. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I, I guess I'll just read the whole thing. I appreciate this funding. Thank you. However, the time frame does create a challenge. We may want to purchase instructional materials for middle or high school students, a real need for us, but with length of project being essentially three school months this year and one in the fall, the time it takes to get materials delivered, I don't think we'll be able to train, implement, and see a lot of growth in student performance by 930, especially at the universal level rather than targeted intervention. Can you give an example of a reasonable goal for improved literature, literacy performance for older students within the purpose of this grant? Or is it more reasonable to use the funds to purchase the materials and focus on training staff to be able to use them next year with the SMART goal addressing teacher knowledge? So we've talked a lot about this as a team over the last week plus, two weeks, three weeks, um, and it is hard. We have a summer in the middle of, of a fairly you know, short grant period anyways. Um, I think you could go either way, depending on what type of um, data and what type of literacy, um, you know, what the achievement data would be that you might be capturing. If you have a local assessment, um, if you're looking at uh, data that you could easily capture on a, a monthly basis and you have a few months of data, that that could be something you use. Uh, for teacher knowledge, we talked about that, something where it's simply a, a goal where, and I know Heidi, I think, talked about this earlier, where you're setting a professional development goal, um, making it realistic, knowing that you might not have 100% of your teachers taking part in it, uh, but making that goal and being specific of what teaching practice, what evidence-based teaching practice you hope to have your teachers learn um, and what you hope to have them implement with their students and having a pre and post survey that shows that before uh, what their knowledge was, what their literacy pra practice was, and then after uh, the use of this grant, uh, what that post survey, post observation um, would show. I'll just piggyback a little bit, Renee, yes, on what please. you were saying. Um, I think the, the second part of that, this question of asking about, you know, if you were going to be purchasing materials for, let's say, to outfit an entirely new core program that you want to implement, trying to get that accomplished between now and um, the end of September, you probably would want to focus more on really the training around the use of those materials for your educators, because you're right, by the time you receive that and you get it going, um, you're probably best to make sure that educators are in a good place to be able to utilize those resources. If, if you've identified as a need, maybe a particular aspect of literacy instruction and a particular evidence-based strategy that you really want to help get off the ground this year in your classroom, then that might be more feasible to measure student growth between, you know, let's say you do some training on that with your educators in the month of March, they start to implement and you follow the progress of students through the end of the school year. That is something that you might be able to measure, but you might be looking at a smaller scope for that kind of a, a project. Could we increase the time spent on literacy coach or specialist for the remainder of uh, fiscal year 24 as part of this? For example, shifting someone's role to focus on developing these functions, PD, coaching, et cetera. So I can touch upon this and then if someone wants to add more or um, piggyback, I think that would be helpful. Um, <clears throat> this, Funding can support um, getting into and looking at reviewing teaching practices, professional learning. So I I think that this funding for the rest of the school year could support that type of a, a role uh, to be giving, like kind of teach the teacher, uh, being able to offer internal professional learning um, and coaching. I don't know if, if anyone else has more to add or piggyback off that. I, I think the coaching would be supporting the professional development 
of your educators. And if yeah. that's, you know, if you've identified a specific area and the coaching is going to focus on that to build teacher capacity, then that would be allowable. And being clear that it's over and above what you had already planned to spend yeah. on that person, mm -hmm. I think will be right. important, which sounds like what you're saying, John. Uh, can we purchase a tech intervention subscriptions um, to be used now immediately for the rest of the school year? I, I think if you, whatever project you build within your application <clears throat> and we review it, and if it's something that you can purchase, implement, spend now, then absolutely that's a, a that's going to be um, a, something that you can take immediate action of, uh, but it is kind of dependent on what your identified need is, um, what you're choosing for um, an intervention subscription. And it, as long as the intervention is, again, for uh, supporting core instruction of students and inclusive of that core classroom in instruction. So it's kind of hard to say for sure because it's, there are, aren't a lot of details there, but and especially one thing I know, and this you might also from the federal funds with subscriptions that's tricky is like you can't purchase a year long subscription, right. even though you're going to use it now, if any of that goes past the the date. Exactly. And so, so, e so that, in case that's in there in it, I know that subscriptions right. are tricky with these funds. Absolutely. That key date of September 30th, I know I've probably said it. <laughs> 20 times but it really is it's really hard that that is that is the end date idea summer training for all elementary classroom teachers regarding core classroom instruction grant pays for trainer travel expenses plus stipend for teachers to attend possibly materials currently we pay when teachers come to an outside of school training would this be allowable i i think that's a, a great example of what this grant could um, reimburse for expenses. Again, a long, as long as the project and the evidence-based training that you're selecting meets the criteria, I think that's a great idea. Uh, Keys to Literacy is great PD, but is not currently an approved provider for Maine. Are you able to use a provider that isn't yet approved? I'm not really quite sure I understand, but maybe Leanne is familiar. I, I'm not either because we okay. don't have approved. We don't providers. have an approved provider no. list or an approved list of materials. What you'd want to be able to do in an instance like this is be able to demonstrate the evidence base mm -hmm. that supports keys to literacy, and as long as you can demonstrate that it's an evidence-based approach, then that will satisfy that aspect. At the end of the list, and I miss any in trying to go through that long list. I don't, I'm afraid I might have, but if you have a question, you can put your hand up or put another question in the chat. Otherwise I would say, um, as we said, we will send out um, FAQs, the presentation, uh, the link to the uh, survey so that you can say whether you wanna want these funds or not so we can get a get, make sure that the money all gets used. Um, and uh, we'll get the questions for the application as well uh, and, and this recording. So thank you all so much for coming. Your great questions. I'm sure they helped. Uh, oh, Laura, question. I am so sorry. I came late. So if you're repeating this, apologies. Did I make this up or is there like a list of recommended resources that will be shared or did I just like imagine that? It's not uh, a list of resources like because the main DOE doesn't have a set uh, list of resources, programs and, and whatnot, but it's a resource of how to find evidence-based resources and programs and materials and how to vet anything that you might find. Um, it just gives some criteria on how to 
uh, establish whether or not a resource that you're looking at is evidence-based, if that makes sense. Yeah, and when did you say that was coming out? I'm sorry, I'm working with my curriculum no, teams right now, so. <laughs> you're fine. Um, so the recording itself might be a couple days. We're at the end of the week, so we'll hope to get the recording out soon. But I'm going to send out a PDF of the presentation, the the resource, you know, the kind of evidence-based uh, criteria document and a PDF of the application, just so you can kind of get an idea of what to gather for information. I'll send that out in grants for me at an e-blast to the LEA authorized rep and the ESCA consolidated application director um, tomorrow. And we're going to do an FAQ. That might take me an, an, a couple days too. Sorry. <laughs> right. Great. And yes, the Zoom is coming, as she just said to whoever asked that too. I want to make sure you know that. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Hopefully you know how to get um, in touch with us uh, and any of us on this call at the DOE uh, can help you. More questions. Sorry, hold on. I keep trying. I keep wrapping it up. <laughs> That's all right. It's good. Are we able to add our email to your list if we were sent here from a higher up? So the um, in grants for me, the person who can update the roles in the address book is typically the superintendent. That's the LEA authorized rep. There's a user access rep. Um, they would need to add you to the role um, if you have a role in grants for me that isn't one of the ones that I listed off and you need me to send it out to that particular role, I can as well. You would just need to tell me what role you have in grants for me. Because grants for me roles are very worded very differently compared to uh, job titles. So I don't know who asked that, Stacy. And you may just want to reach out to Renee too and, and chat. <laughs> Yeah, because I can send stuff. Specific. Yeah, I can send stuff via email too. Uh, and then, okay, is it allowable to buy materials to expand capacity for differentiation and tier interventions? Tier one interventions, are those covered? Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure if it's a different question from from. I think we've talked about it a little bit, but uh, it is for core instruction, and if it's differentiation for within the classroom to meet the needs of students within the grade span you're focusing on. Um, and it is that classroom level interventions. So happening within the classroom by the classroom teacher so in order to support them engaging in the core instruction within the classroom. Hope that answers the question. Practice better wait time this time. <laughs> All right. Well, if you have any additional questions, um, you can stay on and ask them of us or send us some emails. Otherwise, thank you all. I know this is an extension of what was already probably a long day for all of you. And we really appreciate everything you're doing. And uh, we look forward to seeing your application and any additional questions you have for us. Thank you, everyone. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Yep.